4. Ephesians chapter 4 is what we're going to look at on this morning. I want to take the opportunity uh, to uh, thank those that have tuned in via live stream. As usual, it is a pleasure having you to worship with us in this way. Uh, on today, we are going to uh, come to the conclusion of the spirit of offense. This is part four, but this will be the final teaching on today. And so let us look at Ephesians chapter four, and we're going to look at verses one through six. Amen. Ephesians chapter four, verses one through six. I will be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, unless I tell you otherwise. And so, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. I like how verses 1 through 3 in the New Living Translation reads, and that version says, therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always, somebody say always. Always, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. And as I stated in one of the previous teachings, it is God's desire for the body of Christ to walk in unity. Amen. And in order for us to walk in unity, we must be humble. We can't do it without being humble individuals. Pride will get in the way of unity, amen? When an individual is prideful, we must be humble. We must also be gentle, amen? We must be patient. You can't walk this walk and rub lives with people without being patient. And you also must be willing to forgive each other's faults. Because the word tells us we need to make allowances for each other's faults because of love, because of the love that we have. We have to understand it is love that covers a multitude of sins, amen? When it comes down to it, we mess up sometimes. We have some things about us that ain't necessarily right. But we have to be able to love on each other and we have to be able to forgive each other if we're going to really walk in unity. Turn to Luke 17. Luke chapter 17, and we're going to look at verse 1 through 4, verse 1 through 4 in Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. And as I said, in order for us to walk in unity, these things are key. We must be humble. We must be gentle. We must be patient. And we must be willing to forgive, especially when we are dealing with this subject matter about the spirit of offense. Oftentimes when people offend us, we have a, a tendency to get into our feelings, to get upset, to get angry. We don't want to deal with the person. We don't want to forgive the person. But Jesus is telling us that we need to do opposite of that. Amen? And so Luke 17, starting at verse 1, he said, then, then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. They're going to happen. Amen? Live long enough, you will either offend somebody or you will get offended. He said, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. One of the things that we looked at in this passage of scripture, when we went back to the original language for the word offense here, it is talking about being a stumbling block, amen? Being an individual that gets in the way of somebody's personal growth and relationship with Christ, causing them to become stagnant. And so it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him to whom they do come. 
It would be better for him if a milestone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. Basically, check yourself. See where you really are. And it says, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Amen? And if he repents, what should we do? Forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and if you, uh, if it comes to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. But how many of y'all know that even if an individual does not repent, you still have an obligation to forgive them. Amen? Some things just don't always work out the way you want them to work out. But that's not a reason for you to not walk in the forgiveness of individuals that have, have has caused us some issues, slighted us or sinned against us or different things of that nature. And so unity is often broken in the church because of the spirit of offense. People get offended over some of the simplest things, and people get offended quite often. In the same church, people can be at war with one another, often over something petty. What does the word petty mean? It means meaning of little importance, meaning trivial. Sometimes when you have an attitude with your brother or sister, you need to ask yourself, what am I really tripping about? Is it really that serious? Is it because she said to me she didn't like my shoes? Because we get we can trip over some of the most pettiest things. Is it because he didn't speak to me or, or, or whatever the case may be? We get upset over some of the simplest things. So if you have an ought with your brother, if you have an ought with your sister, you need to take a step back and say, why am I tripping? See, sometimes when me and my husband go through things, sometimes he said, I think he shared in the Bible study, how, you know, sometimes when you want to hold on to something and you want to be upset about something and he may get off from work and he on his way home and he say, all right, I know I'm supposed to be mad about something, but what is it? <laughs> Oftentimes, you know, when it's real bad, you just really can't remember what it is, amen? But the bottom line is we get offended over some of the simplest things, things that are petty. When you think about it, conflicts will occur. But it is often over petty issues. It can sometimes be over serious matters. Or it can be over issues that are real or imagined. Things are going to take place. And I'm going to say that again. Conflicts will occur, be it over petty issues, serious matters, or issues that are real or imagined. Because how many of y'all know some of us got some serious imaginations? Yeah. Some of us have minds that go into overdrive, and we make a molehill into a mountain. When it's really not that serious, amen? And so, you know, we, we have thought about a thing and it has gotten so blown out of proportion in our own minds and that ain't really what's going on in the situation. And so, knowing that, we must learn how to handle those conflicts. We need to learn how to shut the enemy down to stop division from taking place in the body of Christ. To stop division from taking place in your own homes. To stop the vision from taking place on your jobs. Matthew 18, verse 15, you don't have to turn there. I'm reading this from the New Living Translation, verse 15 through 17. But the word of God says to us, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. As I said before, we don't often go to that person. We want to pick up the phone and call any and everybody. But the word of God tells you to go to that person that, that has caused an offense with you. Go to them privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again. Don't give up so easy, basically. They didn't want to hear you and receive you one-on-one. -on -one then maybe you need to take somebody else. Because in your heart, you want this thing to be made right. And so go back and take somebody else with you again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Because sometimes you need the witnesses because sometimes when individuals want to get to running their mouths and putting all type of crazy stuff out there, at least you may have somebody else to say, for real, I was there. 
I know what really took place. I heard what was discussed. So even if something contrary is put out there, witnesses are there to really be able to see, okay, we see what's really going on. And so sometimes you need that third party. It goes on to say, if the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or as a corrupt tax collector. Anybody know about tax collectors in the Bible? They were not individuals that people wanted to really deal with. Let's be for real. IRS, ring your phone. You ain't trying to deal with them. It's certain people, in a nutshell, there are certain people that you just want to avoid. If you know somebody is a pagan, and another word for that is a heathen, guess what? There are certain people sometimes you just want to avoid. So if you have tried to do all that you could do, the word of God says treat them like a pagan or treat them like a, a, a tax collector. And so the desire is that, you know, you want to be able to do phase one of that scripture. You want that to be the successful point where you don't have to bring in two or three witnesses and you don't have to bring matters before the church. And so the desire is that phase one could resolve an issue. However, some people are simply stubborn. Amen? What does the word stubborn mean? It means having or showing dogged determination not to change. Amen? Showing dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something, especially in spite of good arguments or reasons to do so. The Word of God wants there to be unity. That's more than enough reason to work matters out because the Word of God wants us to. But when we are stubborn and stuck in our way, we don't care what God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, or Jesus say. We will do what we want to do. And so if a person is so stubborn and refuses to budge, even after going through the steps, then guess what? Deal with that individual according to the word. Deal with them like a pagan, as I said, which is a heathen. People caught up in their feelings are hard to reach. When people's minds are made up and they are stubborn and they refuse to budge, guess what? It's like talking to a brick wall. And so people caught up in their own feelings are hard to reach. Offended people are a challenge. And some will refuse to budge. We looked at it in the scripture last week in Proverbs 18, verse 19. It said, a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. And contentions are like the bars of a castle. That same passage of scripture in the New Living Translation says, an offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. And so in order for unity to be restored when an offense has occurred, we need to confront the other person. Say, I need to confront the other person. To confront means to meet someone face to face. You need to deal with it. It means to meet someone face to face and deal with a problem or a difficult situation. Last week I talked about whether to confront. I also talked about when to confront. And I said in the conclusion, I want to deal with how to confront. Because that's what we need to know. We need to know, okay, this issue is real. I am offended by this thing. What do I need to do? How do I go about confronting this to make this situation right? And so first and foremost, know that confrontation is to establish, it is established to resolve conflict. You're not just going to meet with somebody just to go back and forth with them. You meet with the person to get to a conclusion of the matter. Your heart's desire should be to resolve conflict. Amen? And so confrontation is the act of challenging a person in order to expose what is wrong and establish what is right. And so confronting a person helps establish the truth for the purpose of conviction, for the purpose of correction, and for the purpose of a changed life. And so the focus should be on achieving a better relationship. 
if you know a relationship has been breached in any way, shape, form, or fashion, your number one desire should be to close that breach. Your focus should be on achieving a better relationship or getting someone to stop doing something that is negatively affecting you, that may be negatively affecting others, or him or herself. See, because offenses undealt with, it can cause a lot of problems. It can begin to reach others outside of just you and that individual. It can begin to spread. And when you think about a church, one person can be offended with somebody. Next thing you know, they could be offended with somebody that's just simply associated to the person just because of relationship. When you think about it, that offense can run through the house like cancer. And so you have to be able to deal with it accordingly or it can wreak a lot of havoc. But like Minister Folk said, sometimes you got to be able to look at that devil and say, devil, I see you. Sometimes you got to be able to say, in this house, it ain't happening. You will not rule up in here. You have to learn how to take authority over your atmosphere. You got to learn how to take authority in your own home. Because offenses can take place between partners, marriages, you know, husband and wives, amen? Things can take place, but you got to be able to say, not in here. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to go to sleep on this thing. We're going to deal with this thing because we understand that if it is not dealt with, it is going to wreak so much havoc. Trust me. And so, when you think about it, confronting an individual, let me tell you something. It is not to tell someone off. If you want to meet with somebody face to face to give them face to face to give them a piece of your mind to tell them off, mm -mm, wrong spirit. And so it's not to tell someone off or to simply get something off your chest or to run a guilt trip on the offender. Because sometimes that's what we want to do. We want to have a meeting with you, but we want to try to make you feel as bad about what it is that you've done instead of really trying to help you to become better in a situation or get things right. It all boils down to your motives. Amen. And so therefore, before you go and confront an individual, before you go and confront that person that you have an offense with or who offended you, guess what? Confront yourself first. Confront yourself first. Check your motives. Ask God to show you yourself before you even step to them and have a conversation. And as you prepare for the confrontation, deal with your negative emotions. Because sometimes individuals can offend us and we are angry. Anger is an emotion. It is real. The word of God says, be angry but sin not. You know yourself as an individual. So if you still feel your blood boiling, boiling on the inside of you, guess what? That ain't the time to talk to a person. Deal with your emo emotions first before you actually confront the person face to face. And so deal with those negative emotions. Because if you don't release them, if you don't allow the Holy Spirit to release them, first of all, you got to have one of desire for them to be released. You got to even be willing to say, I am angry. I am bitter. I am resentful. I am upset. You got to be able to say that for real instead of saying, oh, no, I'm all right. I'm good. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to be real with yourself. And if you're real with yourself then and you have a desire to really want to let it go, how many of y'all know our God is awesome? He can move mountains. He can do those things that seem like the impossible. Because sometimes we feel like our anger got such a hold on us that it's impossible for us to let it go. Sometimes it's impossible for us to let it go because we keep replaying the tape over and over in our head. Right. But if you ever have a desire to really want to let it go and you ask God, you will get released from that thing. Then you will be able to go to that person in the right spirit. But if you don't release that thing and your negative emotions are still on the throne, it's going to be a roadblock to the success that you're trying to achieve in the confrontation. It's not going to be successful. And so, when it comes down to preparing yourself to confront an individual, you need to put aside fear. Oftentimes, people don't confront individuals because they are afraid. They're sometimes afraid of what's going to happen if I do confront them. If I do confront them, are they going to no longer be my friend? If you confront them and they no longer want to be your friend, let me tell you, boo, they weren't your friend in the beginning. 
But we're so afraid of what can actually take place. And so when you go through all these things in your mind, you become overtaken by the spirit of fear. And guess what? Fear will keep you from addressing the issue. So if you're thinking about all these things, guess what? You'll never move forward and confront the situation if you are dealing with fear. So you got to set aside the negative emotions. you got to set aside the fear. And so when you confront a matter, you need to be clear. If you say, okay, we need to talk, and the individual say, okay, we can talk. If you want to bring an issue to the table, be clear on what it is you want to bring. Don't come talking in circles. Or don't come and try to talk about something that you are not clear of and inform them. And so if you're going to bring an issue to the table with somebody, be very clear as to what it is that you're confronting. Because if you don't, you'll find yourself all over the place. So you want to have things in order. When you confront a matter, be very clear. You need to be able to explain how the person's behavior has affected you and how you perceive the issue. You need to be able to tell them, you know what? The bottom line is, this is the very thing that bothered me about you. This is the very thing that has me upset at this particular moment, and we need to talk about it. It's not about beating around the bush. It's not about skating on thin ice. It's not about walking on eggshells. Because if you are not clear, you're going to sabotage the outcome. If a person is sitting there and they're trying to figure out, okay, you say you got an issue with me, well, what is it? All they know is they're mad with you. But when you ask them, what is, what is the real issue? Let's deal with that. Sometimes the clarity ain't there. You need to be clear if you're going to confront a thing. What is it that we're getting ready to talk about? And so, talking in general terms is not effective. So get your thoughts together before you meet with somebody face to face. In the confrontation, it is so important that you are aware of your tone. Your tone of voice will determine how your words are received. You can be speaking the truth, but your tone of voice can turn somebody off. And they no longer hear anything that you are saying because of your tone. Yes, yes. So don't go to the high voice. You know, sometimes people get to go and they get into that high voice. You already know, oh, no, nah, this ain't even going well right here. And so the bottom line is, your tone of voice will determine how your words are received. Listen to this. Your tone is the external manifestation of your current state of mind. See, your tone is really expressing where you are on the inside. And so guess what? If you're angry, then it will be evident in the things that come out your mouth, in your tone, because you are still upset and boiling and seething on the inside. So even though you're trying to have a conversation, what's inside of you is coming out of you. If you are going into a situation and you are optimistic, it is your desire that this thing really be resolved, then guess what? That will be manifested. That you really have hope that this thing will turn around. Again, some people like to confront, and it ain't for the right reason. But if your heart is in the right place, it will come out in your tone. Won't be a whole bunch of neck twisting and eye rolling and improper body language and things of that nature. It will be evident. In a confrontation, you must be willing to listen. You may be the one that has set up and established the meeting because of something that has offended you. But you must be willing to listen to the person that you are confronting. Communication is what? It is an exchange of information. So confronting ain't about you being the one that's talking only and all I do is listen. No, it's an exchange of information. You may have called the meeting, as I said before, but you should not be the only one that is speaking. And so to effectively resolve conflicts, you must be able to discern what's really going on. And oftentimes, you are able to discern what's going on by listening. 
always tell people, you want to learn something about a person, just let them talk. Just let them talk. There's a whole lot that you will learn about an individual as they talk. So as you are having that face-to-face -face meeting and you all are discussing, you're listening, they're listening, you're going to be able to discern, hmm, I hear what you're saying, but this is really the root cause. See, because one, you got to understand, your mouth could be saying one thing, but when you're listening and you're discerning and God allows you to discern what's going on, you really see that what was the offense really ain't the problem. It's something deeper. And you'll only find out through listening. So you must be able to hear what is being said as well as what is not being said. And so as you listen, you may be able to hear what the root cause of the person's behavior, where it is actually coming from. And some of the root causes to conflict are these things. You can get into a conversation, and you may find out in the midst of it, something took place, an offense took place, you and the individual may be tripping or whatever the case may be, but now as you begin to deal with them, certain things will be re revealed. You may re it may be revealed in the midst of the conversation that there's some fear, some insecurity, and there's some jealousy. As you listen, as you propose questions, different things of that nature, you may be able to discern it's a deeper root. Sometimes conflicts, when you think about it, the root causes of the conflicts are sometimes envy and grief. Listen to the conversation. You will see what's revealed. Sometimes the root causes to conflict are sin and rebellion. That's at the root of a thing. Sin and rebellion. Sometimes the root causes to conflicts are unexpressed or unmet expectations. See, one thing about it, when we have expectations and our expectations are not met, we are, we are disappointed. And so sometimes that can cause us to take on a whole lot of other emotions because of unmet expectations. You got to get to the root cause of stuff. Sometimes unrealistic expectations. How many of y'all know some people live in a fantasy world? And they have expectations about some stuff that just ain't right. Especially I think about a whole bunch of my single ladies that, that look forward to getting married and they ain't never been married and all this stuff. They so excited about getting married and they got all these wonderful expectations of what their Prince Charming is going to be like, what their marriage is going to be like, unrealistic, and then they get into it, then they trip. Trying to figure out what is really going on. Google, your expectations was unrealistic. And so unrealistic expectations will cause you to have a deeper conflict and next thing you know, you at odds with each other. You're trying to figure out what's going on. Your offenses is coming because you ain't getting what you thought you were supposed to get. When you think about it, the root cause, some of the root causes to conflict are not only unrealistic, unrealistic expectations, but undefined roles and responsibilities. That can happen. Just think about it. I'm thinking about ministry. Sometimes you can have conflicts in ministries when people don't know what their roles and responsibilities are. So then you have this person is doing with somebody, what, what they're doing one thing, this person is doing something else. This one feel like this one shouldn't have no business doing this. But for real, you know, if the roles and responsibilities are really defined, you won't have unnecessarily co unnecessary conflict. But sometimes when they are not defined, you will have problems. And so that could be the root cause of a thing. So sometimes when you feel, when you understand that is the problem with some stuff, get some stuff in order. I know with me in this church, there are certain things that I have been putting in place, getting stuff in order. So one thing about it, stuff may be different than it was in 2003 when we started the church. It may be different than what it was even last year. But guess what? If I'm getting stuff in order, I'm getting stuff in order. I'm defining rules. I'm defining ro uh, roles and responsibilities. And the thing is, once that stuff is in place, it will cut down on a whole bunch of conflict. Individuals won't be getting upset and offended about things when certain things are in place. And so, when you think about it, some of the other root causes to conflict are different values and opinions. That is key. You can be with an individual, and you all have the same values. God, family, work, health. Let's just talk about them four. Those could be the values of two people that's in a marriage together. But if you ask those two people to write down those things as they see it as a priority, what's number one, what's number two, what's number three, and number four, 
You will find so often that people can have the same value, but the priorities are different. So when the priorities are different, see, God may be number one to you, but health may be number one to them. So then it's going to cause conflict. Family may be number one to them, and, and work may be number one, one to the other. That's going to cause conflict. It can bring about offenses in a relationship when individuals' values are not the same. And it's amazing because there are so many that are with individuals and they don't even understand the source of the conflicts in their relationships. And oftentimes it's because your values are not the same. So when this person does something that you don't necessarily like and you get offended by, it's because they there and you're here. The values ain't the same. I shared this before and it was amazing because I went to a, a, a pastor's uh, a, a luncheon and the guy who actually spoke, he was talking about values. And so he gave us a list of five different values. And, and, and one of the things that, you know, he had us to do was put it in order to what was important to us. I couldn't wait to get home to my husband because I said, okay, I'm going to give you these five words. I need you to put them into, in, and prioritize them according to what's more important from the, mo the most important to the least. How many of y'all know our things were identical? Everything that we chose was identical. And I thank God for that. But when you don't have those things lined up, when your values are different, you will deal with a whole lot of conflicts that are unnecessary. And so, not only undefined roles and responsibilities and defining roles of opinions, vain ambitions and power struggles can be a source uh, of root cause to conflict in some individuals. Because some people, they in competition with you. And this ain't no competition. But they have they, they a power trip. Want to wanna be seen, want to be known, want to be in, in control. And in demand. Come on now. Sometimes if that's on the inside of a person, it can bring about offenses. It can bring about conflict. So you got to be able to say, mm, I hear what you're saying, but this thing is deeper. It's deeper. When you listen, you're able to see it. You're able to hear it. You're able to discern it. Uh, something else that could be at the root cause. Is, is a limited or scarce re, uh, limited or scarce resources, meaning time, money, or, or uh, a space. Sometimes a person can be offended because they feel like, I don't have no time to myself. I need some space. I mean, how many of y'all know you could be married, but you still need some time for yourself? And then if you don't get that time for yourself, then you got that little attitude. So now your attitude rubbing off on your spouse, your spouse is offended, and for real, the source of the conflict is you feel like, I ain't got no space. I need a little bit of time just to, just to do me. Not cut up, not sin, but everybody needs some time to themselves. Money can cause some problems. That could be the root cause of why a person can do things or say things and it offends you. Language barriers. Major. Because what we may say in our culture, somebody else may not say in their culture, we say it and now they're offended. But it's like you didn't even understand what I was saying. Because you can have one word that can have multiple meanings. Like, like we can say, oh, man, that, that's bad. Now, for us, we know that's good. Solomon may think, bad, that's horrible. You're saying that's horrible. No. The language barrier. I'm just saying it because he's from the islands, Haiti. But the reality, sometimes language barriers can cause conflict when you don't really understand what the other one is really saying. Lack of information. Lack of understanding of the needs of the different temperaments as well. And so, listen, without your own preconceived notion of what you think is the root cause. Because sometimes you can meet with the individual to confront a situation, and you're already going in there with your mind made up like you think you know what the root cause is. If you go in with that mindset, again, you're going to block yourself from being able to hear what you need to hear. A closed mind will keep you from receiving revelation. And then when you actually confront, ask questions. Let me tell you something. When God confronted Adam and Eve in their sinful state when they messed up, God asked them a question. Where are you? Who told you you were naked? We already know God knew the answer, right? But he needed to hear from them to really discern where they really were. So sometimes when you're confronting a situation, you need to ask questions. Asking questions is to encourage 
the person that you are confronting to think seriously about their attitude and their actions. Because if you say, well, we've been friends for a long time. And as long as I've been knowing you, we talked on the phone every day. But we don't talk anymore. You used to call me, but I want to know, why don't you call me anymore? I call you, I leave you messages, but you never return the call. So when you ask that person, why don't you call me anymore? Now they got to think. And then they got to really come up with, dig deep with what's going on inside of them. And if they lie, you'll be able to discern. And so you got to ask them questions to get the person to dig inside of themselves, to think about their attitude and their actions. Asking questions causes them to acknowledge their actions and examine their intentions. And so when we confront matters, the desired outcome should be resolution. It's wonderful when it occurs, amen? We all want things to work out well, but how many of y'all know that doesn't always happen? Sometimes you can confront a situation and it does not work out the way you desire for it to happen. When you cannot resolve a conflict, sometimes you got to be mature enough to agree to disagree. Because you ain't going to always see eye to eye on everything. So you have to be willing to agree to disagree. And that is when you tolerate but do not accept the opposing position. You remain on good terms even though you disagree about the unresolved issue. An example could be in a marriage. You have children. You all don't agree on how the discipline is done. One person, they, you may think the other person is too harsh in their discipline. They think you too soft. You all had this conversation. Y'all talk about it. You've talked about it more than once. Guess what? It gets to a point you got to agree to disagree. You got to ask yourself, is it really worth this marriage being at odds? Because we don't agree over this. It ain't that major. It can, it's some, some things you got to be able to say, okay, because we done talked about this 50 times. <clears throat> I ain't changing the way I feel. You ain't changing how you feel, but we're going to still be able to get along. It takes maturity to be able to do that. And so if you get to this place in serious matters, then this is when you need to bring in a third party. See, the Bible tells us to go to the person one-on-one -on -one first. Then sometimes if it gets to the point that it's, it's really serious and you know it's not something that you can really push to the side and y'all ain't seeing eye to eye, this is when you want to bring in somebody else. Because sometimes you need that third party to be there to be able to give you counsel. It is important to seek, seek wise counsel when needed. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 is what we're getting ready to examine. And I won't be before you much longer. But we're going to look at Acts chapter 15. And we're going to start at verse 36. Because sometimes when you confront a matter, and it is your desire to resolve the conflict, it does not always happen. And so, how many of y'all know, sometimes the best resolution to a conflict is separation, even if it's temporary? I'm going to say that again. Sometimes the best resolution of a conflict, where individuals just don't see eye to eye on the matter, and it's intense, sometimes the best Solution or the best resolution is separation, even if it's temporary. Acts chapter 15, starting at verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to work. Paul had an issue. We was on an assignment, and this joker didn't hold up to his end of what he was supposed to do. 
So he's basically saying, oh, we still got work to do, but he ain't going. He ain't going with me. I'm, I don't want him to go with me because for real, I'm still a little bothered about the fact that he abandoned us the last time. So he said, he ain't going. So there was an issue. Verse 39. Then the contention, amen, became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicily and strengthening churches. Guess what? Both of them still, all of them continue to do the work of the Lord. They just ain't do it together. There was a, con a contention that caused them to separate. It was necessary because sometimes stuff can get so heated, it's like we ain't even going to work well together. So for real, you need to go on about your way and I need to go on about mine. Because we're going to do more damage than we are going to do good. And so sometimes it causes for a separation. But I said temporary. Because when you think about it, they were reunited again on another journey. Paul ain't want to have nothing to do with John Mark. But then there was a time when he said, get Mark and bring him with you. For he is useful to me in the ministry. They were reconciled. That took place in 2 Timothy, amen, verses 4 through 8, 4, chapter 4, verse 11, when they were reconciled. But right here in Acts, they separated, did other journeys. But they eventually came back together. And you think about it. I even think about marriage because I've been saying a lot about marriage. Marriages go through stuff. It can become very rough sometimes. The contention can be so heavy. And the two of you just ain't saying eye to eye on situations. Sometimes the resolution for a conflict may be separation. It may be separation. Not a permanent separation because that's never the desire. But it may be separation. The word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. See, the thing is, sometimes issues can be so rough in a marriage that people need to separate for a season. In that time, they have an opportunity to really think on matters. They have an opportunity to work matters out. It ain't a thing of you run and go to the divorce court because we aren't down with divorce, amen? We don't want divorce to be the only option, but sometimes it happens. Let's just be for real. We ain't gonna lie and act like it don't happen. But for real, sometimes you need to go over here. I need to go over here. I'm gonna work on myself. You're gonna work on yourself because together we ain't helping each other. And I think away about the statues in Merlin, how when you separate, you can't even get a divorce until a year later. Because the whole key is you hope the resolution is able to take place. So sometimes individuals separate for a season. But God can work in that situation and bring them back together again. But sometimes that separation tells you, mm -mm, this is over. You never know. Because every single conflict does not get resolved all the time. And so the bottom line is don't run out and divorce your spouse. But sometimes you may need space to rethink and to evaluate the unresolved conflict. No matter the situation, whether matters get resolved or not, guess what? You got to forgive the person that offended you. You may never get an I'm sorry. You all may never see eye to eye. But the bottom line is you got to forgive the person that offended you. There is no legitimate reason to not forgive a person. I don't care what they've done. You understand that? Some individuals really feel like, oh, they did this to me. There's no way that I should forgive them. Somebody molested you when you was younger. Guess what? You're supposed to forgive them. Somebody physically beat you down. You're supposed to forgive them. Somebody lied on you and, and, and put your name through the mud. You're supposed to forgive them. Somebody cussed you up, out, up one side and down the other. You're still supposed to forgive them. God doesn't put any conditions on forgiveness. And so even when you come in contact with people that have offended you due to the spirit of offense, 
you still have an obligation, no matter how things turn out, to forgive them. And again, forgiveness is for you. It's for you. Unforgiveness will keep you in bondage. Let it go. And so confrontation is necessary. You should confront when someone is in danger of hurting themselves or others. You got to know there are certain things that should cause you to confront. Get past yourself. When somebody is in danger of hurting themselves or others, it's time to confront a situation. Don't sit on the sideline and ignore it. Amen? You should confront when a relationship is threatened to, uh, you should uh, confront when a relationship is threatened. Your reason for wanting to confront it is because you have a desire to preserve the relationship. You should confront when division exists within a group. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. You should confront when someone sins against you. You should confront when you are offended or others are offended who can't defend themselves. Because sometimes there are individuals that are not in a position to handle the situation and you see it. That's when righteous indignation steps in. You see it and you address it. You confront it because somebody is unable to. Just think about somebody that does something to a child. A child can't really address the situation properly and really discern how things should be handled. Sometimes you can see a matter that is taking place and you got to confront it. So you should confront when someone is caught in a sin. Confrontations can create unity when it's done properly and the resolve takes place. But you also need to understand that confrontation can also divide when it is done at the wrong time, in the wrong way, under the wrong circumstances, or in the wrong spirit. So remember, you need to consider a lot of things before you confront. So these are some things that let you know you should not confront a situation. Amen? You should not confront when you are not the right person to confront. If you are not the one offended, you may not be the one that needs to confront it. If I have an issue with Angelita, Alice don't need to confront Angelita. You're not the one. I may have told you about it, but it ain't on you to confront. I need to confront it because I'm the one that have the issue. So you may feel sorry for me and say, oh, God, this thing need to get together. No, it ain't your place because I'm well able and so is she. And so... You should not confront when you are not the right person to confront. You should not confront when it's not the right time to confront. That is key. Timing is everything. You should not confront when you are uncertain of the facts. Again, don't try to confront a situation and you don't even know what you're talking about. So you should not confront when you are uncertain of the facts. You should not confront when it's best to overlook a minor offense. Some stuff is too simple and petty to confront. Don't waste your time, effort, or energy. You should not confront when you are committing the same sin. Because one thing I said, you should confront when someone sins. But you should not confront when you're committing the same sin. Deal with that big old log in your eye before you try to deal with somebody's speck. You should not confront when your motive is purely to satisfy your own rights. You just want to get your thing off. You want to just give them a piece of your mind. But you ain't really thinking about confronting this situation to make the thing better and whole. And even if you know a person has an issue, you're not confronting them because you really want to see them get help. You just want to tell them off. You should not confront when you have a vindictive motive. You should not confront when the person you want to confront has a habit of foolishness and arguing. When you know a person's character and their nature, baby, don't waste your time. You should not confront when a person has a habit of foolishness and arguing. Avoid people who are unwilling to recognize their offense. You should not confront when the person 
who offended you is your enemy. What do you do with your enemy? Just pray for them. But you got to understand your enemy will never have your best interests. So why are you going to waste your time and confront them? They don't have your best interests. You pray for them. You love them, but we ain't got to be together. So why would you waste your time in confronting your enemy? And so this teaching can really go on and on, but I'm bringing it to a close on today because when you deal with the spirit of offense, when you deal with confronting individuals, I mean, it can, it can really go on and on. It's very detailed, but I'm bringing it to a close. I pray that you all have been blessed. I pray that you all have been uh, given some tools and how to deal with confrontation. Uh, we have to understand that the spirit of offense has caused too much division in the body of Christ. It needs to stop. We need to grow up. Look at your neighbor. Say neighbor. neighbor. Grow up. Grow up. Offenses will come, but we must handle them quickly and according to the word of God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come right now, Lord God. We thank you for this series, Lord, on the spirit of offense. Father, I know that as we went through this teaching, Lord God, you show each and every one of us something about ourselves. And Father, I pray that we don't overlook what it is that you revealed. Areas that we need to work on, Lord God, I pray that we would just really apply your word and just work on getting our hearts right. Get out the bitterness that's in our hearts, Lord God. Some of us, Lord God, have just been bitter just in so many different ways for so many years, and it just spills over in so many of our areas, Lord God. And we find ourselves offended about everything, Lord God. Help us, Lord God. Father, some of us are just too sensitive. Help us to not be so sensitive and take on everything in a negative way. Father, I know as we went through this teaching, it's so easy for us to think about other people, Lord God, but Father, shine the spotlight on us. Show us what needs to be changed as individuals. And I pray, Lord God, that even if this is not a new word, it's a repetitive word for some. But God, I'm asking that we, the body of Christ, will really apply the word and address matters before they get out of hand. Father, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. I'm going to bring Minister Folks back up as she continues on with the rest of the service. Amen.